Glad you're able to join me today and this evening and take time together to study the Dharma and to practice the Dharma. So let's take a moment to situate ourselves and to create a sacred space. Whether we visualize that we're in a gompa or in a temple, wherever we are, we let the outside world, our daily troubles, our daily inconveniences, and our daily thoughts, our worldly thoughts kind of fade away so we can focus on our practice and our study for the moment. Even if that happens to be in front of a screen, happens to be in our kitchen or our living room, our office, somewhere that we normally do worldly activities, we're transforming that right now into a place for sacred or spiritual practice. And we take a moment to set a very strong motivation. The reason we've come together this evening is not simply so we can improve our understanding or not simply so we can find benefit for ourselves in this life through our practice of compassion and bodhicitta, but so we can develop the techniques and the wisdom and the method that we might work to eliminate the suffering of all sentient beings. Now we recognize that the best way to help sentient beings is by improving our minds and becoming Buddhas. And as Buddhas, we'll have the perfect means to be of most benefit to other sentient beings. So we study and we practice for the sake of achieving perfect, complete enlightenment for the benefit of other beings, not for the benefit of ourselves alone. And our coming together this evening and study and practice is working toward that end. So with, with that motivation that we've come together, And so we'll start very quickly, briefly, with prayer of refuge and bodhicitta. In the Buddha's Dharma and Sangha, until enlightened I seek refuge, through merit from giving and the rest. To aid all, may I become Buddha in the Buddha's Dharma and Sangha. Until enlightened, I seek refuge through merit from giving and the rest. To aid all, may I become Buddha in the Buddha's Dharma and Sangha. Until enlightened, I seek refuge. Through merit from giving and the rest, to wait all, may I become Buddha. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I'm happy to be here, happy to have the chance to spend this time with you. And I rejoice that you've been able to find time to be here as well. Uh, our lives make it difficult sometimes to find time for Dharma. Even though we understand that that is how we should live our life according to Dharma. We try to infuse it in everything we do. But our lives are busy, right? And it can be difficult. And sometimes the effort to go to another class, it can be a lot of work. Even though it's supposed to be bringing us joy in the moment, it takes effort. And so I rejoice greatly that you've all been able to exert the effort to be with me. And I'm happy that I was able to exert the effort to be with you as well. Um, a little housekeeping. So last week uh, for homework, there were some articles and I had you read one article in the handout as well as um, Karisana, the first chapter of Making Life Meaningful by Lama Zubrin And so this week for our last homework that I'm assigning or suggesting, here I put it in the chat. The second chapter of Making Life Meaningful by Lama Zopar Mbache, as well as two more articles that are in, or two more essays or, or articles in the handout. The fourth one on the six perfections, and then the seventh one called Living with Bodhicitta. And so I recommend those over the week to keep your mind suffused with Bodhicitta understanding. Those are great opportunities to study and to improve uh, and deepen your study. And so I recommend those. And if you have any questions about them or any questions about last week's, of course, feel free to ask. Uh, same caveat as last week. Uh, I'm still in India, so I still have an unreliable internet connection. So we're doing the best we can. Seems a little more stable now. So who knows? We're, we're, we'll roll with it. 
if I disappear, uh, I'll try to come back. But like last week, there was some lag or some stuttering, which I don't realize. I know when I disappear, but I don't know if that's happening. So if that's happening, uh, you know, get my attention and we'll try to fix it as we go. But I appreciate your patience with, uh, with you know, all the obstacles that Samsara is throwing our way. When did um, Lama Zopa write uh, Making Life Meaningful? Oh. It's nicely you know, written. It's um if you go to the website um in the I didn't send it to you I sent you the first chapter but there's a net editor's introduction that precedes that and they talk about it I think it was um it was quite a while it was in I think the 80s I think it was a a Copan course from the 80s is where they took most of that material from okay. you know most of I'd say almost all of Capitolo Mosmerich's books are actually um, Dharma teachings he's given that have been compiled and edited into book form by usually the Lama Yeshe Wisdom Archive. And that one has been around for quite a long time. So I think it was a talk in the 80s, but they say in the introduction. And if you want a physical copy of the book, if you go to LamaYeshe.com, they have many of these books are available for free. And there's another great one on Bodhicitta as well. I can't think of the name of it right now. It's probably like how to practice Bodhicitta or something very simple like that. There's a lot of free books they offer. Um, you just have to pay shipping. There are some books that are a small fee, the ones that took more time or effort to produce, like the bigger ones. Um, and they also offer ebooks and audiobooks of some of them as well. So I highly recommend just going to lamiashow.com and seeing if you want physical copies or, you know, proper ebooks instead of uh, PDF articles or website. And Venerable Jenny has a question. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, I'm trying to look for the six perfections, handout number four and number seven, and I can't find it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Do you have the hand the the handout? No, I just have. There's just this link here that you sent. Oh um, yeah, okay. So I'll the the handout is available on the website on Two Dead Noble Links website, but I'll put it in the chat as well. It's a PDF. Thank you so much. No problem. And it's a collection of seven or eight different readings that are recommended for this course. And so we've been going through them over the last couple of weeks. And so there are two more readings, number four and number seven. And so they're in that. And I just put that in the chat. So you should have access to that PDF. You can download it. Excellent. This is, no problem. Um, this is both number four and seven in the PDF. The, 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 so there are three separate things I recommend for this week. The first one is the second chapter of Making Life Meaningful, which is available online, and then the fourth article and the seventh article in the handout. And you'll see there's a, uh, a table of contents, so you can see, you know, all the different articles that are in there. And those are the ones that I recommend. Got it, got it. Thank you. But they're all great, they're all great articles. So any of them you haven't read, I recommend, yeah. you know, or reading them over again. I get to read them all again when I was preparing for this course, so it was really quite a joy. So, you know. It's not very long. They're very short articles. So anytime you have a chance to read Dharma over again, it's quite wonderful and joyful. So thank you so much. Of course. Yeah. Can I just before we start, I've been listening to our, our um Bodhi Chita um uh talk and I just I just have this like really um silly question, but I I just like to know your thoughts. Is it is it really possible that someone like myself that is so regular, um, who lives in you know society, and you're and coming at you are all these like, you know, y y people around you constantly, and you know, is it really possible? Or is it wishful thinking that you like you become enlightened and you can help all sentient beings? Like, how is that possible? Or is it just sometimes I think I'm just it's just wishful thinking and I'm pretending to go along, but I don't hmm. quite believe it. Like, how is that humanly like I just right now is so selfish. I just feel like I just want to get out of samsara because how do I help? the true like how do i help everybody like do i come back again and again in my birth as a human being because i don't want that i don't know that's just what i'm thinking no that's great that's a great thought that's a great question i think it's a mixture of both i think it's a hundred percent possible you know it wouldn't if it wasn't possible then there'd be no, no point to our practice okay so it's a hundred percent possible 
whether we're practicing Tantra or practicing just Sutra, for us to improve our minds, to achieve bodhicitta, to have realizations of emptiness, and to be of great benefit to other sentient beings. Now, we can't actually remove so their suffering. Hmm? I don't mean to interrupt, but like I find the more I'm practicing, um, the, the less I want to be around irritating people because they just irritate me. And because they, like, like for example, today, like I just find a lot of the more I'm practicing, the more I'm noticing people completely unaware of like how to be generous, how to be kind, mm. be compassionate. And it seems like it's just me putting that into the friendship. Um, and, and so person, when, when you see that in others, what's your first thought? Anger. Do you feel frustrated? Yeah. And so instead, that needs to be an opportunity for you to have compassion. Because think of how much they're suffering. Think of in your own life when you lead with anger or with frustration or with unkindness. Does that create happiness for you? Or does it create more frustration and more anger and more dissatisfaction? You know? And so when you see other sentient beings, whether they're people who call yourself, themselves your friends or your coworkers or just strangers you meet who are always grumpy and angry and don't have kindness in them, right? Think of how much suffering that they're experiencing, both in that moment and how much suffering they're creating in the future for themselves. Why and, not you go, oh, the, and you say, oh, the Tibetans like, oh, ninja, ninja means compassion, right? How sad, you know? So when you see that, that's the perfect opportunity for you to practice because you see that they're suffering because all pain, all, um, all frustration that comes from suffering, right? All the ill will that people wish upon others and that unkindness that they act with, that's suffering. And so in the moment, it may be difficult for us because we're still so ordinary and we're still gripped by the self-cherishing mind. But at least in reflection, at the end of the day, you can think of these interactions you had and you say, oh, that person was suffering. That's why they acted that way. That's mm -hmm. why they acted without kindness or compassion. That's why they acted in a way that was harmful to me, but also harmful to them. You know, mm -hmm. we say that other sentient beings they can't really harm us. The worst they can do is kill us, but which sounds pretty bad, but that's just ending this one life. But the negative karma they create in that process will cause them suffering for countless lifetimes in the future. So the way they're hurting themselves is so much deeper than the way they can hurt us. So instead, we see other sentient beings as an opportunity for us to practice. How could we develop patience? which is one of the perfected activities of a bodhisattva, if we didn't have other sentient beings in relationship to practice it with, you know? How can we practice compassion if we don't have other sentient beings who are suffering that we can observe? So I agree with you that sometimes the more you practice and when you're able to see a sense of kindness in your heart and compassion, and you start living your life more motivated in that direction, it becomes more clear to you how other people are deluded and how they act out of ignorant mind, whether it's self-grasping, self-cherishing, or just anger, or pettiness, spite, how these things kind of rule so many people's lives. I agree that that becomes much more visible to us as we practice. And then I just one more thought. And then what happens is that my self-cherishing feels like well, why can't you do that for me? Why can't you be, why can't you think that, you know what, this time with you is, is precious and I want to spend it with you and I am going to dedicate the time with you and I'm not going to rush off because I need to go clean my house or, you know, that's, that, that's what happens. And it's like my practice I, I, I am putting effort into my practice, but I'm also noticing how others around me are not mm -hmm. even aware. They, they, like, they don't have that generous spirit of like giving or thinking about me in a loving way that I think of them. And mm -hmm. so it's so selfish of me. I know because I shouldn't be thinking that, but it happens. It does. It happens. But that's when we remember the advice from the mind training that says it's much more valuable to find a single flaw in ourselves than to find a thousand flaws in others. You know, seeking out others' flaws doesn't benefit us at all. And even if we're not doing it intentionally. So I, I appreciate 100% what you're saying. And I share the experience quite a lot. But you're right to point out that's just your self-cherishing mind. 
right? That's our mind that says, I need validation. Yeah. You know, that's my mind. And so when you realize that, it's wonderful that you can realize that. It's really great because most of the time we have those same thoughts, but we aren't able to recognize where they're coming from. So the fact that you're able to say, this is my self-cherishing mind acting out and my self-cherishing mind that's saying, I expect something from you, which right. shows that the giving you're giving isn't pure. It's tainted oh. by some sort of attachment or expectation exactly. and self-cherishing. But so that's great. It's great because think of how long you've lived without realizing that. And then, so the fact that you're realizing that now gives you something to meditate on. And the more you can actually defeat your self-cherishing mind, which is hard, it's, it's been controlling us since the beginning of some, since beginning of this rebirth, right? So it's not like it's an easy thing to do, but the more you can slowly, slowly, slowly defeat your self-cherishing mind, then you start noticing that those kinds of minds of attachment and those um, expectations dwindle and you stop when you engage with others, even though the relationship may be the same, that person may not have changed. You don't feel that frustration and anger anymore. All you feel is compassion and you find joy in every interaction, whether it's one where that other person is giving toward you or they're being selfish. So the way to overcome that experience yeah. is to defeat your self-cherishing mind. And the first step is to realize that you're under the control of the self-cherishing mind, which you've done and you've articulated really, really clearly. So that's wonderful. I, I rejoice. That's so hard to do. It really is. You know, we spend so much of our life under the control of all the delusions and we don't even realize that we're being led around like as if we have, you know, a ring in our nose and we're being, we're oxen being, you know, led to the slaughter. We don't realize that. So the fact that we are able to have some understanding, oh, all of this frustration is because I expect something back from that person. That's my self-cherishing mind. That realization is huge and it takes a lot of work to get there. So- get angry with it because like I I find myself as I'm deepening my like I'm not I'm talking like as if I'm up into like the forest practicing it's not I'm just noticing that I'm putting more effort um into my practice and I'm noticing my friends shortcomings in it not not generous mm -hmm not sacrificing to be like, okay, you know what, like, I'll meet you halfway, or I'm just noticing their flaws. And it's, and I'm, I don't, and it angers me because, like, I feel like there's no, there's no, like, back there's at no, me. Yeah, re <laughs> reciprocity. Yeah, like, there's, reciprocity. Nothing back, there's nothing coming back at me. Like, there's, okay. and I, I just don't want to get frustrated about it. So, um, okay, I think maybe I'll, I'll answer a little bit and we'll leave it there so we can go with the rest of the course and we can talk, we can have more questions at the end if we have time. Um, it's common as we practice that, so this is a, a comparison. When you start practicing mindfulness meditation, just focusing on the breath and trying to observe any thoughts that come and let them go. You practice it every day for, and after a while you noticed results, right? You notice that you can keep your attention for longer and you have less disturbing thoughts coming and you feel your practice strengthening, getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And you notice like a rise. And then at some point, what's very common is all of a sudden it feels like you're overwhelmed by these interrupting thoughts again. And you thought you'd been making all this practice going up, 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 and you feel like you've jumped off the edge of a cliff and you feel like you've gone backwards. Mm -hmm. And they say, what really is happening usually at that point is that those, all those interrupting thoughts that you see as newly coming have been there the whole time, but you had never developed a level of concentration to even realize those interrupting thoughts are in your mind. So all the interrupting thoughts that you noticed before were the coarser ones, the rougher ones. And by getting rid of the rough or the coarse stain, then the more subtle ones become apparent to you. But at that moment of them becoming apparent, it all of a sudden feels like you're going backwards, right? It feels like you're not doing, you're not making forward momentum. So it's easy to become discouraged. And so that's very common. So the deeper you are into your practice, the more these kind of um, mistaken minds and flaws and become apparent to you, and it's easy to become overwhelmed by them. So that's common, a common experience. So what we do with that is when we're aware of that, again, we need to bring it into our meditation practice because our meditation practice is a time when we can get rid of our external um, uh, distractions and just focus on our mind itself and how it's progressing and how it's relating to others. And we can use that mind, that opportunity to strengthen our mind, to get rid of our self-cherishing and really analyze how is it our self-cherishing or our ignorance that grasp at the self is truly existent. How are these things causing all of our deluded minds to infiltrate our life? 
And then by doing so, how is that bringing unhappiness and suffering in our life? And when we become confident in that, then we can start applying remedies. So it's a common experience to notice the flaws of others in that way. And, and that's the reason we have the advice that says that's not of any benefit. Since you can't wipe away their flaws, all you can do is live by an example and transform your own mind. So that's why we have the teaching that it's much more valuable to see a single flaw in yourself than a thousand flaws of others. So the best we can do is when we experience it during the day, bring it into our meditation at night and try to empower ourselves, like going to the gym, strengthen our heart in such a way that when we go face the next day, we have more tools, more resiliency, and more resources to have compassion for others who are suffering in that way instead of frustration and anger. And we can allow that to be a sign of our practice deepening. And so that's an opportunity for rejoicing. And we use that to inspire us and motivate us to keep practicing. But I know that may not be a satisfying answer, um, but let's go with it for now. And we, I'll have more time for some questions at the end. Try to get through the material. I'm very good at um, getting sidetracked and kind of talking in circles. And so we only have two sessions left. So I wanted to try to avoid that a little bit and keep us at least get through all the material. And then I can get distracted later. You know, in the, this does kind of go with what I was, with what we're talking about though. In the beginning of each session, I try to talk about creating a sacred space. And when we look at Tibetan Buddhism or even religion in general, the idea of the sacred and the profane, right? Or the worldly and the spiritual are these dualistic ideas. But what Buddhism is trying to do is saying that we shouldn't have this distinction between sacred and profane. We should be bringing the Dharma, the Holy Dharma into every single aspect of our life. And this is something common to other religions. You know, when I was studying in my undergrad, one of my degrees is in religion, and I read a lot of Jay-Z Smith and Bruce Lincoln, you know, contemporary 21st century scholars of religion. And uh, there is a lot of um, study of ritual and what's the purpose of ritual. And one of the purposes that they believe in ritual is to collapse the idea of the sacred and the profane. So ritual is a way for you to take sacred actions and make them part of your everyday ex uh, experience. And by doing so, you collapse this distinction between what is sacred or what is profane or what is normal and what is, you know, super mundane. And in Buddhism, we do this all the time. And there are a lot of rituals we do. And there's different types of rituals. Such as, for instance, even in the beginning of these sessions, at the beginning of the series, I talked about the six preliminary practices before a meditation session, about setting out statues and images of the Buddha, making perfect offerings, doing prostrations, sitting in a certain posture, offering certain prayers, doing a uh, visualizing the guru field in front of you or the merit field and, and offering a mandala and so forth. This ritualized action is for a reason, right? It's not just because it's fun to do. Um, it's because for one, it puts us in a lineage of practitioners, of great practitioners of the past, the present and the future. So it situates us in this place, in this lineage of Dharma practice. But what it also does is it creates actions that are beyond our worldly experience. So it says these, our worldly experience of conventional reality is not how reality truly exists. It's our perception of reality. And so by using these external practices, this ritualized behavior, we're able to get rid of, momentarily step out of, our conventional experience of the world. So part of ringing bells and holding doorjes and doing all these, you know, hand mudras are to bring us out of our conventional reality and to tap us into something beyond ourselves, even if we don't have the cognitive, the cognitive ability to understand it at this moment. Those are all tools to help us break down our perception of conventional reality and to give us a glimpse into, to let our mind see the vast expanse of ultimate reality. So part of our ritual practice is to bring the sacred into our everyday life. And if you've practiced any Tantra, we know this very clearly, right? Tantra practice involves visualizing yourself as the deity. So it's actually saying, I'm visualizing myself as Chen Rezi, the Buddha of compassion. All of my speech is the speech of a Buddha. All of my actions are the holy actions of a Buddha. Okay. My body is the body of a Buddha. So those are the meditations you do. So that's very clear, bringing the sacred into your profane, bringing the result onto the path. But even without discussing Tantra, that's a very easy example. All of our activities do that. All of our sacred activities, all of our ritualistic activities. 
And so I know some people, when they come to Tibetan Buddhism, especially they see a lot of ritual, a lot of weird chanting, a lot of incense, a lot of bells, a lot of bells and whistles. And they say, what, what am I getting into? I thought I was learning to train my mind, not how to like start a weird orchestra. And I appreciate that, you know, uh, I appreciate that. But I think if you're open-minded to it, it can allow you an opportunity to break through your habitual way of being in the world. So even creating or participating in a ritual like offering water bowls every day, or when you sit down to meditate every day, or sit down to study your Dharma text or whatever it is you're doing, you have a ritual where you offer a certain prayer, you set a motivation and you go through a ritualized practice. What that helps you do is break free from your ordinary way of thinking and put you in a space that's a sacred space. And the more you're able to do that, then that line becomes more and more blurred. And so you stop needing to rely on external validation and you can use your internal, uh, your internal practice becomes sacred all the time. I have a friend who, a friend of mine from grad school told me how he, one story when he was living in Dharamsala, um, he's not a monk, but he speaks Tibetan fluently and he was at Norbulinka Monastery in Dharamsala. And at one point the Dalai Lama rolled in with his entourage but there wasn't like a teaching schedule. There wasn't anything on the docket, you know? And he rolled in. So my friends said, what's going on? And they said, oh, he's doing exorcism for us because we have some harmful spirits that have been causing problems here at the monastery. So his holiness is going to do an exorcism to help get rid of these harmful spirits. And I've been to exorcisms before. Um, I have one here at my house, actually, from a monk that I live with who is possessed. And Tibetan exorcisms, you know, they're a very ritualistic thing. And they involve so many like external things. You, at the very least, you have a torma that you'd be offering to these, you know, and you see this if you go to a tantric initiation, they offer torma to all interfering spirits. So they say any interfering spirit who might want to disrupt our proceedings today, let me at least give you this gift. And you take this gift in exchange for agreeing not to be a disruption to our practice. That happens at every tantric ritual, right? An offering of a torma, a ritual cake. But in exorcism, sometimes you see an effigy of the person who's afflicted or if it's an exorcism of a place. You know, there's all these bells and whistles. And so His Holiness is sitting at a throne they had, and there's, you know, a skull cup and a peacock feather and all these avadra, all these ritual implements for him to use in this ritual. And he just sits down and he puts them all aside and just sits down like this and meditates for about a half hour. And then he just gets up and he leaves. And my friend goes to one of his attendants and he goes, wait, 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 what, what just happened? I thought he was doing exorcism. And the attendant says, oh, he did. He meditated on compassion. So someone like the Dalai Lama doesn't need these external things. He doesn't need to be holding a dagger, a porbu, or a vajra. He doesn't need all of the ritual because his mind is so strong that he doesn't need those things. He can tap into that sacred moment and just use pure compassion, and that's all he needs. But for us, since we haven't developed our mind that way, to that extent, these external rituals, sometimes they may seem silly, but they benefit us, you know? When you're doing a Lama Chopa and you're, making, you're reciting the verses of offering, and, you know, as you offer, you... You actually do this mudra and you visualize the offering goddesses leaving your heart, making offerings to the merit field, and then re-entering your heart, all these things. That helps you remind what you're doing. It helps you remember the practice. It helps make that practice something that you embody instead of just speak the words really quickly. You know. So our goal is to collapse this distinction between sacred and profane. And we do that by practicing bodhicitta, by developing an understanding of compassion and making that suffuse every moment of our life. Everything we do, once it becomes led by bodhicitta as like our flag bearer that we're following, then in that way, everything we do is sacred. You know, everything we do is super mundane. So that's why we need to develop bodhicitta. That's when we need to develop compassion. And you, I've been saying over and over again, and I know it sounds kind of like a catchphrase, but bodhicitta is radical, right? It is revolutionary. And I think, you know, Jenny, you gave a perfect example is we don't, in our everyday life, we don't expect people to be kind. When people are kind or compassionate, we're surprised. We say, oh, look at that person being so kind. That's a surprise to us because actually having compassion isn't the norm. It's not what we've come to expect from people. So when you live your life purely by compassion, that is totally against what is expected from the status quo and how most people live their lives. So when I say that it's radical or revolutionary, that's what I mean. It's taking what is normal, quote unquote, and turning it on its head and saying, this isn't normal. All this is is suffering. But that doesn't mean it's easy. 
one of the one of the stories I think of quite a lot, and I almost don't know what to do with them, but I'm sure many of you have heard the story of the Tigris. Um, it's a very common Buddhist story. The place I first became familiar with it is taught in the Sutra of Golden Light in the 21 chapter version, but it appears in other places as well. And the story, the Buddha is telling a story, they come across relics and the monks ask like, what are these relics? So he tells a story of how at one point there were these three princes in the forest and they come across a tiger or a tigress who had just given birth maybe a week before and she is starving and emaciated and weak and she has five cubs and they say she'll surely either starve to death or eat her cubs because she has she's too weak to do anything else and so the prince is very sad about this and they have some compassion but then they go on their way but one prince says i can't leave it at that i have to do something about it so he goes back and his heart is so full of compassion. He says, I've cherished this body my whole life, but what is this body except for, you know, this rotting flesh of an, a holder for pus and these putrid foul substances. So at least I can use this foul body to benefit others. And he offers himself as food to the tigress because he says, surely, um, you know, her suffering is so great. And if she were to consume her five cubs, that would be even great. You know, if she, if she dies from starvation, they'll die. Or if she eats them, that's even greater suffering. So he lies down in front of her and she's too weak to even eat him. So he realizes this. And so he doesn't have any weapons on him. So he breaks off a stick of bamboo and he uses it to cut his own throat so she can lap up his blood and gain strength. And when he does, the whole world shakes and there's an eclipse that covers the sun. It's like blackness for a moment. There's a huge earthquake. And at that moment, there's one goddess who's living in the forest who notices his deeds and says, what a hero among men. And she rejoices and flowers rain from the sky. But at the same time, his brothers feel the earthquake and they burst into tears because they say, surely our brother has given his life. And they go and they see his body and they faint from grief and they're overwhelmed by grief. And at the same time, then you see the picture of what's happening in the palace. And the queen had been having a bad dream where her breasts had been cut off and her teeth had been wrenched from her mouth and she had been holding three doves and one of them had been plucked away by a hawk. And she wakes up because of this earthquake, terrified about the nature of both her sons. And she goes to the king who's also terrified. And eventually they realize that their son has been taken from them and they pass out from grief. They go into a frenzy in grief. You know, the king says, the joy of gaining a son does not compare to the pain of losing one. So aren't those men happy who have no sons or who have the joy of dying while their sons are still alive? And the queen says, I must have a heart of iron that it hasn't broken and killed me. My grief is so great at losing my precious son. They say she screamed out like an animal who'd been struck in her vital parts. And I think of this scene and this contrast with what the prince had done was an act of pure compassion, an act of a bodhisattva. Yet the way worldly people experience that act is not with joy, but with grief and with sorrow because their attachment is so strong. Because they don't have minds that are situated to the Dharma. They don't have minds that are infused with bodhicitta. So they aren't able to see his action as being a holy action. They see it only from their own side, which is one of profound loss and grief and sorrow. And the reason I sit with this teaching is because not that I think we should all feed ourselves to the animals of the zoos. And the idea of giving up our bodies to benefit others is very, very difficult for most of us or for all of us. So I'm not advocating that we go and do that. And I'm not saying that the experiences of the king and queen are incorrect, right? Grief at the loss of a loved one is a normal experience. But this idea that he was acting out of pure compassion, compassion was so foreign to our worldly way of being in the world, that instead of seeing that compassion, they only focused on their own grief. That's all they could experience. So I sit with that because it reminds me how radical and uncommon compassion is. And surely his act of bodhicitta was extreme, but still we're so unfamiliar with compassion and bodhicitta that our first instinct is to look at how it affects us, my self-cherishing, not how that compassion or bodhicitta can exist in the world in a more meaningful way. So that story just reminds me of how difficult this project is that we're undertaking. The idea of becoming Buddhas, that it's not easy and that it's totally against the current of what is expected of us in society, what we're taught to believe. 
And so that's why it's a radical practice. That's why it's a revolutionary practice. And the revolution is internal, right? That's how it has to be. It has to come from the inside out. It doesn't come from the outside in. When we take, when we develop compassion, and that leads to bodhicitta, we say we, bodhicitta makes us responsible for the happiness of all sentient beings. That's what we take upon ourselves when we practice bodhicitta. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be responsible for all sentient beings' happiness? For me, what it means is not carrying the burden of feeding my own ego. For me, it means being free from these shackles of being a slave to my own pleasure, my own delight. When those are no longer holding me down and I'm only working for others, then that's a freedom. And there's so many ways that we can benefit other sentient beings that it's not like there's nothing we can do. No matter what resources we have at our, you know, available to us, well, there are different ways we can act to benefit others. All of us have some way we can benefit others. Not necessarily in a physical or a, a worldly way, but at least in a spiritual practice we can do. And so if I'm dedicating myself to working for others and bringing their happiness, that frees me from the shackles of my own self-interest. And so we'll talk more about that today as we go through the idea of cherishing, self-cherishing and cherishing others. Because to get to that point, we're actually free from that. Where we actually develop a mind of bodhicitta, we have to develop it slowly through our meditation practice. It can't just, it's not a switch that we can flip overnight. And so that bodhicitta, we have to gradually familiarize ourselves with it. We have to meditate on it. And to do that, first we have to develop compassion and then great compassion. And then from there, that altruistic intention that not only sees others suffering, but then is determined to do something about it. And from that comes bodhicitta. And so that's why there are these meditative technologies or practices that help us develop that sequentially. And so in the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the seven point cause and effect method that was made popular by Asanga. So we tend to start with developing equanimity, which isn't one of the seven points, but we develop equanimity, re recognizing that all sentient beings, whether we label them as foe or friend or stranger, are equal in deserving happiness and not wanting suffering, and that we shouldn't prioritize the one over the other because those labels, those ideas, are mere projections from our deluded minds, from our attachment to our friends, our anger towards those who harm us or our enemies, and our indifference or our ignorance to strangers are what project those labels. But those labels have no basis in reality. So we start with equanimity, and then we remember that we recognize that all sentient beings are our dear mother, not in this life, but in infinite lifetimes since beginning is rebirth. They've been our mother over and over again. So we develop confidence in this. And then we remember the great kindness that our mother has shown us over and over again in this life and in past lives. And then due to that kindness, we develop the strong um, wish to repay our mother's kindness. And so from that strong wish, we develop great love, which is the wish for that all sentient beings to be happy and have all the causes of happiness. And we develop great compassion, which is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering and all the causes of suffering. And as we meditate on those two, they get stronger and stronger. We develop the altruistic intention that says, it is my responsibility. I will take upon it. I will take it upon myself as my responsibility to relieve the suffering of all sentient beings. And then that develops into bodhicitta. At first, just what we call bodhicitta, that's like the bark of a sugar cane. So it has the flavor of bodhicitta, but it's not real bodhicitta because it's not effortless. It takes a lot of meditative concentration and effort. And when we're not focusing on it, it goes away. But that's how we start with that flavor of bodhicitta. And then as that strengthens and deepens and deepens, it becomes actual bodhicitta. That brings us onto the path of Buddhahood and to the Mahayana path of practice. So those are the seven steps that we talked about. And so today's course, today's class, we're going to go, we're going to discuss the other method, which was taught by Shantideva, or is credited to Shantideva, though it came from the Buddha, and then from him to Manjushri, to Nagarjuna, uh, Chanchakirti, eventually to Shantideva, who discusses it in his text, the 
Bodhisattva Avatara, which is the Bodhisattva's way of life. And then it's made more explicit um, through Geshe Chekwa, who was one of the early Kadampa Geshes. Atisha taught both methods, but this method he taught in secret because it involves Tonglen, which is a mind training practice, which might be um, too advanced for some. So he didn't feel it was appropriate. He taught it to his heart disciples. And from him, it went to Drum Tompa, who was a lay person. And if you don't know, Drum Tompa was a teacher's heart disciple and his translator. Um, and yet he was a lay person. He had a family. He still achieved high realizations in Buddhahood. Um, so you don't have to be an ordained person to achieve realizations of Buddhahood. Drum Tompa was a lay person. And from Drum Tompa, it went to, I think, Potowa. From Potowa, it went to uh, Geshe Langri Tampa and Sharawa. And then Geshe Chikawa had read the eight verses of mind training, um, which was composed by Geshe uh, Langri Tampa. And there was a verse he had a question on. I think it was the verse about making yourself lower than all, except others as higher than yourself. And he wanted to go find him and ask him to give a commentary on it. But at that point, Langri Tampa had passed away. But Sharawa had studied with Langri Tampa. So he received instruction from Sharawa. And due to that, he felt it was an appropriate time to make this teaching public. And so he composed the text, the seven point treatise on mind training, which includes um, instruction on exchanging self and others. And there are further commentaries to that. So that's where we trace the lineage of this practice back to. And by remembering that, you know, it's not important for our everyday practice, but it does remind us that this isn't something that we just made up, that there's an actual lineage of practice that goes back to great teachers. And so by practicing in this way, by going through these steps, we are situating ourselves in a bigger tradition, okay? We're not just making something up because it's convenient. Traditionally, they say there are a number of benefits to bodhicitta. There are 10 that they list that are supposed to be inspirational, such as bodhicitta is the sole gateway to the Mahana path. And when you achieve bodhicitta, you become, you achieve the rank or the title of a child of the Tathagatas, of the Buddhas. And you outshine anyone with bodhicitta for even a moment, outshines the arhats, the Hinayana arhats, due to their compassion and bodhicitta. And not only that, you become a supreme object of offering. So you become an object upon which other people can accumulate good karma. They can accumulate virtue because of your bodhicitta. And that bodhicitta allows your merit to grow and multiply very easily without much effort because that bodhicitta infuses all you do. And in the same way, it purifies all your negativities, both preventing new ones from occurring and purifying past negative karma becomes very easy and quick. The bodhicitta is like a very expedient means to do that. And any dharma activity that you try to accomplish, you accomplish without any real difficulty because that bodhicitta aligns you with dharma in that way. And when you do have obstacles or hindrances or experience harm, it doesn't actually bother your mind. So it doesn't mean that all of your external obstacles go away, but you experience them without disrupting your mind. You quickly complete all the stages of practice and meditation. And you become a source of happiness for all sentient beings. So these are common benefits of bodhicitta, they say. And some of those, for me, are more inspiring than others. But they are inspiring us to practice. For me, what's most inspiring is I think of bodhicitta in my life and compassion in my life. And I don't have any taste of bodhicitta. I barely have an idea of compassion. You know, I have the words in my mouth, not a lot more than that. But the few moments in my life when I've been able to lead with compassion, the joy I've experienced just from actually touching compassion in a meaningful way has been so profound that it encourages me to practice more and more. So if you can think in your life a moment when you actually were acting selflessly and only wishing to help others for them not to be suffering and how that made your actions more meaningful and more profound to you, we surely have some small experiences like that in our life. So those can be inspiration to us, inspiration to realize that those are just the tip of the iceberg of what we can do if we actually develop great compassion and bodhicitta. 
And so by committing ourselves to virtue in this way, we can improve every moment of our life. We can take the sacred, we can take the otherworldly, the super mundane, and make it our everyday experience. So we're no longer living a worldly experience, but we're living the experience of a bodhisattva, regardless of the difficulties that are going on in the world around us. And by living a bodhisattva experience, we can affect those around us to experience more happiness and to have less suffering. And so by thinking of my own baby experiences in this life, that inspires me to practice bodhicitta. By seeing other teachers and lamas and practitioners I know who, for me, they seem to embody bodhicitta and compassion and seeing them act in the world and seeing how much joy they have and how others relate to them because of their kindness, that inspires me to practice bodhicitta. So these 10 reasons I gave are the traditional ones and those might inspire you. And if they do, great. They inspire me in an intellectual way but in a more emotional way, it's looking at my own experiences and looking at teachers and other meditators and lamas I've met and seeing them exist in the world. And that's inspiring to me. And so the method of exchanging self and others is very, um, is very taught very briefly. And so what Tsongkhapa did was he formalized this way of combining the method of exchanging self and others along with the seven point cause and effect meditation. And he wasn't the first one to do this. If you look at even um, Sei Kilbu's commentary on the seven point mind training. So he, I think was in the uh, 13th century or the 12th, late 12th century, early 13th century. He was using similar meditations where in order to do the, the equalizing and exchanging self and others, you first meditate on other sentient beings as your mother and think of their kindness. So Tsongkhapa wasn't the first one to incorporate these two um, practices, but he was the first one to really formalize it and say, here are these 11 steps that we go through. And if you practice these 11 steps, that's the efficient way to do this practice. So, so the way Tsongkhapa formalized these 11 steps is we start with um, equanimity. And so it begins the same as before. We start with equanimity. And then from there, we recognize that all sentient beings have been our mothers. And then we remember the kindness of sentient beings as our mothers. But we also remember when sentient beings were kind to us when they weren't our mothers. So there's two different types of kindness we focus on, not just the kindness of the mother, of giving us this human body, of preventing us from um, um, experiencing harm and nourishing us from uh, teaching us the ways of the world, the kindness of the mother who's willing to sacrifice her own self for our happiness and to accumulate negative karma for our benefit. Those are in common that we've already talked about. But we also, on top of that, think of when sentient beings weren't our mother, they were still indescribably kind to us. They were kind to us in ways by giving us the opportunity to practice dharma, to practice patience, even when they were on the outside, it seemed they were harming us. So their kindness doesn't have to be intentional on their part for us to recognize how kind they are to us. We say that all happiness in this life comes from other sentient beings. All happiness comes from their kindness. But it's our misunderstanding of kindness. We have such a limited idea of it that our idea of kindness is really our self cherishing mind saying, what are you going to give me? That's how we define kindness toward ourselves. So the fourth step is um, thinking of, excuse me, the third step is remembering their kindness, not just when they were our mothers, but when they were not our mothers. So two types of kindness, we remember. And then the fourth step is wishing to repay that kindness. So that's the same as the earlier practice. And then we come to this. This is where the equalizing and exchanging self and others becomes the predominant practice. So in the first practice, the sevenfold, this would be where we practice great love. But here we start by practicing equalizing ourselves and others. So what do we mean by equalizing ourselves and others? It's actually similar to equanimity. What equanimity is doing is recognizing that all other sentient beings are the same and that the label of friend, enemy, stranger are projections, right? And that there's no distinction between other sentient beings, whether they try to harm me or whether they are precious and dear and kind to me and benefit me in this life. What equalizing is doing is saying not only are all sentient beings the same in that way, but myself and other sentient beings are the same. There's no reason I deserve happiness in a way that's more important than their happiness. There's no reason that they deserve to be, that I deserve to be free of suffering. It is more important than their freedom from suffering. 
So we're equalizing my needs and others' needs. And, you know, we talked about the nine reasons or things to reflect on to develop equanimity last week. There are six relative reasons and three ultimate reasons. And the six relative reasons were three relative to oneself and three relative to others. If you think of those three relative to oneself, those are actually speaking to developing e the mind of equalizing. So those nine reasons, again, you can refer to last week's class, but the three ultimate reasons, the three ultimate reasons are recognizing that the labels of friend, enemy, and stranger are mere projections from a deluded mind. And that's one. And that they appear to us as if they're permanent um, and static, but that's not the case. They're actually impermanent and constantly changing because nothing in samsara is definite. And the third one is that even we are so interdependent with others that the idea of oneself is dependent on the idea of another. We wouldn't be able to, in the same way, you can't have tall without taller without smaller or here without there. Our identity of self is dependent on there being other. And so in that way, we're intimately connected to others. And so therefore to label them in any conventional way is missing that interdependent relationship we have. So oneself depends on there being the existence of others. Therefore, we're intimately connected to them. So those three are the ultimate reasons to develop equanimity. And then the three relative reasons relative to others are all sentient beings are equal in their wishing to have happiness and not be suffering. All sentient beings are equal in needing help. And all sentient beings are equal in being tormented by deluded minds. So those all relate to equanimity very clearly. But the three reasons that are relative to oneself actually relate to equalizing. And the first one is that all of our happiness in this life depends on the kindness of other sentient beings. And not only that, the second one is our liberation and our enlightenment also depends on other sentient beings, their kindness. And um, lastly, other sentient beings have kindness to us that is equal to the Buddha's in the way that they engage in their relationship with us. So those three are showing that other sentient beings and ourselves are equal. Not just that they're equal, all sentient beings themselves are equal among themselves, but they're equal to us. So what that does is it erases this distinction of my needs versus the needs of others. So when you're equalizing yourself and others, you are not prioritizing your own needs over others' needs. You're saying they're the same. You're recognizing that any harm others give comes from suffering, comes from ignorance. And by recognizing that, you're, not motiv you're motivated to not discriminate against them. Any harm they may give doesn't come from anything other than their own suffering. And their, their desire and right to be free from suffering is the same as my own. So my needs and their needs are the same. And this doesn't mean we neglect ourselves. It doesn't mean that I'm not important. And it's easy to get that kind of mindset, especially when you study the mind training teachings, because a lot of them use very forceful language that, that indicate like everyone else is more important than me. And that is the way to kind of develop really strong bodhicitta and to really defeat your self-cherishing mind. And so those practices are for a very specific person, for a uh, purpose. But in our lives, it's not to say we neglect ourselves. We take care of our body and our mind and we strengthen our body and mind and we don't harm ourselves at the expense of others. And that does seem um, contradictory to the story, right? Of offering your body like the Buddha did to a tiger. That's because we're not there yet. If you could actually offer your body or offer your health in such a way that you don't have any resentment, any anger, any frustration, nothing but pure love and happiness and joy, the opportunity to do that, then we can do it. But until we can do that, then it's not a practice we actually should be doing right now. That's what we're working towards. The Buddha was able to offer his life to that tiger in a past life without a single minute moment of resentment or anger towards that tiger or frustration or sadness. There's nothing but joy at the opportunity to offer to others. So until we can develop that level, then that practice is more advanced than where we're at. So that's a goal, right? To be able to offer even our own life to others. But until there, we take care of our body, take care of our mind. So we're not neglecting ourselves for others, but we are saying that our needs aren't more important than others' needs. We're not prioritizing me. We are saying others' needs are just as important as my own.
if we think we're more important than others, then how can we actually help others? How can we benefit others? If our mind still places me at the top of the pedestal and says, I get my share of the pie first, and then others can get my scraps. That's not real benefit, not internally or externally. So we need to equalize ourselves and others and say, my needs are the same as others' needs. There's no hierarchy in that way. And so that's the step of equalizing. And then the next step is reflecting on the many disadvantages of the self-cherishing mind. So we've talked a lot about self-cherishing because that's what prevents us from developing compassion in bodhicitta. It leads all of our actions to be non-dharma. And bodhicitta is one of the pure and best antidotes to that. So what is self-cherishing? It's the mind that puts me first, my needs first. The mind that says everything I'm doing is for my own pleasure and to avoid my own pain. Everything I'm doing is so I can have a good reputation. Everything I'm doing is to avoid people disliking me, um, avoid any sort of loss and only profit myself. That I am the center of the universe. That ego mind. That's the self-cherishing mind. It's fueled by ignorance, the self-grasping that believes I truly exist. But the self-cherishing mind invades all of our thoughts and it's insidious because we don't think of it. We don't realize how much our interactions are based on what we expect from others, how we expect others to validate us, right? And that causes nothing but suffering. All the suffering I've ever experienced, it comes from our self-cherishing mind. That's the real enemy. External enemies are nothing compared to our self-cherishing mind. As I said earlier, an external enemy might kill our body. Our self-cherishing mind can keep us trapped in samsara for eons, which is far greater suffering than just the harm you can inflict upon my body in this one life. Lama Zuba says, because we have always cherished ourselves more than others, all of our efforts at attaining happiness have been fruitless. They haven't gained any result. And the reason is our self-cherishing mind. And we can think in our everyday life, when we have acted in such a way that's focused on ourselves, has that brought us happiness or has it created more stress in our lives? Has it caused more disruption and unhappiness? When we cling too tightly to how others perceive us, has that made us happier or has it made us more you know, unhappy? I know when I first started studying practice, when I first started practicing Buddhism, like very devotedly, so in college, I'd find myself so frustrated with other people who were like very new agey. I went to a very like, um, a very liberal left-wing uh, university in, on the East Coast. And so there's lots of like new age, hippie, crunchy granola people there, which is wonderful. Um, I loved it, but I find these people who are like, oh, of course I'm Buddhist. I meditate every day. I watch my breath. And I also have crystals and I also do this and I also do that. And you're like, okay, you're not Buddhist. You just look at your breath. That's great. Wonderful. Great for you. And I'd find myself so frustrated because I'm like, I'm not like those people. Those, those aren't Buddhists. I'm Buddhist. What I'm doing is Buddhist. There's something else. And I didn't want myself lumped into this category of being associated with why, what I saw as like new age spiritualism, you know, a little bit of picking this and picking that and not having any firm commitment to anything. And I get so frustrated by them calling themselves Buddhist because I didn't want their identity as a Buddhist to be conflated with my identity as a Buddhist. You know, I'm a real Buddhist, whatever that means. And then I realized, I was lucky enough to realize, wait, what? What is this mindset doing to benefit me? Who cares what they call themselves? If they identify as Buddhist and that makes their lives more meaningful and it gives them a reason to practice mindfulness every day, that's incredible. How many people have never tried to practice mindfulness once in their lives? So if taking that label upon themselves helps them, that's an opportunity to rejoice. And whatever they call themselves doesn't affect me. And even if people compare me to them, who cares? That doesn't affect me. What affects me is my mind and my practice. And I was clinging so tight to this idea of this identity of Buddhist because I just, you know, found Buddhism and I was so enraptured by it and practicing that I clung to that idea and that label so tightly and how others viewed me that it was just causing me stress and unhappiness. And it was unhappiness at others practicing mindfulness at that. It wasn't even others doing something harmful. It was others doing something virtuous and it was causing me stress in my life. 
That's all because of my self-cherishing mind that was grasping to these ideas. So we can think of experiences like that when we've had this self-cherishing mind become to, come to the forefront of our practice and see that it's only caused us unhappiness. The self-cherishing mind, when we are meditating on the disadvantages of self-cherishing, those are good examples to bring up. And I'm sure most of us have had similar ones in our life. Self-cherishing prevents any opportunity for happiness. And it, more importantly, it prevents us from practicing the Dharma because it makes our idea of ourself as more important than anyone else. And as long as we have that idea, we can never practice Dharma. Nothing we're doing is Dharma. If the eight worldly concerns are what are guiding our actions, whether explicitly or implicitly, we're not practicing Dharma. We're practicing worldly conventions. And that leads only to suffering. Those are first class tickets, you know, to lower rebirth. So these are some of the disadvantages of self-cherishing. It brings nothing but dissatisfaction, like drinking salt water to satiate your thirst. It never brings happiness. So there are many different examples of this we can think of. Those are just some of them. So this is, that's the next step in this practice, is meditating on the disadvantages of self-cherishing. So once we have equalized, once we've said my needs are not more important than others' needs, by doing that, we're already looking at self-cherishing in the face and saying you're not important, right? That's the first step, by equalizing ourselves with others. And then... At first, we're just kind of speaking that, and then we want to make that feeling more real, right? So we say, what are the many disadvantages of self-cherishing? Then the next step is, what are the advantages of cherishing others? So after you meditate on the disadvantages of self-cherishing, you meditate on the advantages of cherishing others. And so those are just the opposite of the first one. So in the same way that compassion and love are two different sides of the same coin, wishing for sentient beings to be free from suffering and wishing them to have happiness, in the same way, meditating on the disadvantages of self-cherishing, we flip it and say, okay, from a positive perspective, what are the advantages of cherishing others? And so we say, if self-cherishing brings only suffering, cherishing others brings only happiness. If self-cherishing does nothing but cause us to be reborn in samsara over and over again and to experience nothing but dissatisfaction, cherishing others brings us to the path of Buddhahood and brings nothing but a satisfied mind and contentment and peace, an undisturbed mind. They say, if you just think of the practice of karma, once you're able to cherish others more than yourself, then you're able to more freely practice the six perfections, the, the six paramitas, the perfected activities of bodhisattvas. And so they say, for instance, from practicing um, generosity, we receive wealth. From practicing patience, we receive beauty. From... Um, Practicing eth ethical discipline, we um, actually they say we, we <laughs> having a nice scent. The 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 scent of ethical discipline comes. The perfume of ethical discipline, but also it helps us um, have a long life in this life and in future lives and have fewer physical obstacles. So these all come from practicing the six perfections, from practicing the life of a bodhisattva. But that itself comes from cherishing others. So we can flip all the, uh, the examples we used for how self-cherishing is disadvantageous to think of the, advent, the advantages of cherishing others. That's the next step in this process. And then comes exchanging. So actually, in the 11 points, exchanging isn't one of the points. Exchanging is kind of inherent in Tonglen, which comes next, giving and taking. But when we talk about exchanging, in this practice of equalizing and exchanging. I, I guess I should give the 11 points. I didn't list them, just so you have them, right? So equanimity, recognizing all sentient beings as being our mothers, remembering their kindness, both when they were our mothers and when they were not our mothers, wishing to repay their kindness. So those four are similar to what we already practiced. And then equalizing self and others, that's the fifth. Meditating on the disadvantages of self-cherishing and then meditating on the advantages of cherishing others, that's six and seven. So then eight and nine, are practicing love and compassion, but practicing them through the practice of Tonglen, so giving and taking. So taking other suffering upon yourself and giving them all of your happiness and joy. So there's a meditative practice to do with Tonglen. And they say, let the giving and taking ride on the breath. So on your out breath, you give away your joy and happiness. And on your in breath, you take suffering. 
And I'll talk about how to do that. But so that's eight and nine. And then 10 is developing that altruistic intention, that special intention. And then 11 is bodhicitta. So those are the 11 steps. So exchanging isn't actually included in there because it's implicit in um, Tonglen. And it's implicit or developed through meditating on the disadvantages and advantages that develops the mind of exchanging. So what do we mean by exchanging? We're not, you know, swapping bodies with other people. We're not swapping positions. What we're doing is swapping our focus. So we're swapping our mind of self-cherishing and exchanging that for a mind of cherishing others. That's what we mean when we say exchanging. So first we equalize, we recognize that all sentient beings are the same as us, that we, our needs are not more important than theirs. And then once we have that realization, we, instead of, we take our self-cherishing mind and we exchange it for a mind that cherishes others. And let's that be our motivating factor. When we think of, we've lived with self-cherishing for so long, what exists in the absence of self-cherishing? If you can actually be free of self-cherishing, what is there? Something to think about. What kind of freedom is there when you're not always attending to your own whims and to the perfections of samsara? What kind of love and compassion can just develop naturally? What kind of contentment of mind when you're not always seeking out something else, when you're not trying to validate your existence with new things, with new shiny objects, with others' praise, with more wealth, with more accumulations? When you don't have any of that, what is left? And what is left is a, a mind that's content all the time, that's satisfied all the time, that doesn't need external validation. A mind that is so dedicated to helping others that you see any sentient being suffering and immediately you want to work to eliminate that suffering. So when you can get rid of the self-cherishing mind, you find a peace, a freedom, a spacious independence that's free from the bondage of samsara. And we still have ignorance, we still have attachment, we still have those minds. But when you can get rid of the self-cherishing mind, what you find there in its absence is really the beauty of contentment and of satisfaction and of actual love and compassion that aren't tainted by attachment. So by exchanging our own desire to benefit ourselves with the desire to benefit others, by exchanging our self-cherishing mind with the mind that cherishes others, that's how we can find this kind of freedom. And that leads us to develop real compassion and real bodhicitta. So then we come to the practices of love and compassion, which are in the form of Tongmen meditation. So for those of you who haven't given instruction in Tongmen, um, we'll do a little bit of it today in our meditation practice. But Tonglen is a, it comes from the mind training tradition. And Tong means to send, and Len means to receive. And so it's a practice of sending all of our happiness, and we usually visualize that in the form of white light, and receiving all of other suffering. And we usually visualize that in the form of like black smoke, like black oily smoke. And so we picture sentient beings in front of us, and we can picture either a specific sentient being, if there's a person we're practicing for, or all sentient beings. And we picture as we breathe in all of their suffering, all of their unhappiness, their dis-ease, their own self-cherishing. It leaves their body in the form of this black smoke. It's kind of oily, um, yeah, smoke is the easiest way to visualize it. Some have it more like an oily, viscous liquid, but whatever works for you. There are some where you visualize it as like scorpions and other things like this, but I think the black smoke is the easiest one. And as you breathe in, you take that from them and you breathe it into your own body. And as it enters your body, what it does is it settles down to your self-cherishing, which is at your heart. And it's like a giant mallet beating your self-cherishing into, into submission. So you visualize taking on their suffering and whatever that suffering is, physical suffering, emotional suffering, the suffering of sickness, all that suffering, you use it to defeat your own self-cherishing. You use it like a weapon. You say, instead of cherishing my own happiness, I'm going to take the suffering upon myself. And then as you breathe out, 
the pure white light, the cooling radiance of your happiness leaves your body. It follows your breath. So you can either visualize it emanating from your heart or you can visualize it riding your breath, whichever way is easier for you. But usually we say it emanates from our heart and it's absorbed into their body and it brings them every happiness. And it takes with them all of your happiness. So there's many different ways to do this visualization. You can visualize giving away all of your things. So all of your worldly possessions ride the white light into their body. All of your wealth, all of your happiness, your joy. You can also visualize um, yourself, your own body, like little miniature versions of your body on the tips of all the light beams. And they extend into the whole world. And anything that they come in contact with is filled with your happiness and your joy. You become like a servant to bring the happiness of others. And so there's different types of way to do this visualization, but it rides upon the breath and we alternate between one and the other. So as you breathe in, you take on suffering. And as you breathe out, you send love and happiness and um, joy. And so we often do this practice in relationship to people who are sick. But the truth is, we don't do this practice expecting external results. So you don't do this practice expecting I can cure someone's sickness by taking their suffering upon myself. We don't have kind of these magical abilities. If we have a very strong practice and we have a strong karmic connection to other people, we can help eliminate some obstacles that may be like external obstacles that may be in their life, but they still have their own karma they've created. We can't eliminate that. We can't purify their karma, but we can help remove obstacles from their life, which might help them actually experience recovery from sickness. But that's not the measure of success in this practice. That's very uncommon because this practice is about inner transformation, not expecting external validation. But what is beautiful about this practice, and this practice is why this was kept secret by Atisha. He didn't think every the, the public masses were ready for this kind of practice, it was because this practice confronts samsara head on. It doesn't shy away from samsara. It looks samsara in the face and says, give me all you've got, and I'm going to take it and transform it into a tool to defeat my self-cherishing mind. It's not um, shy, it's courageous, you know? It stands at the front of the army battling the self-cherishing mind and it leads the fight. And so this takes a lot of um, inner fortitude and perseverance and courage to do, which is some of the reasons they call bodhisattvas, you know, warriors or heroes, pao, pamo, because they have the courage to look at samsara in its face, and then instead of running away, running towards it and defeating it. So that's what we need to do with this practice. And what this practice does, by using other suffering to defeat our self-cherishing mind, we've already become convinced through the other stages of the practice that self-cherishing does nothing but harm us. And that the only way to find happiness in this life and in future lives for ourselves and for other sentient beings is through cherishing others. Even having that conviction we still have this self-cherishing mind guiding us. But then by looking at other suffering and saying, may that suffering ripen on me, may all of their negative and harmful experiences be mine, by taking that and really having the mindset that wants to experience their suffering, that defeats your self-cherishing. That is what transforms your mind. That is what makes every moment you do a moment of Dharma and not a worldly practice. The beauty of Tonglen, once you become just accustomed to the practice and the visualizations is you can do it anywhere. You can be on your commute to work and you can see someone, you know, either on the subway next to you or in the car next to you on the highway who looks like they're going through a difficult time or they're angry or they're stressed out. And you can just take that moment to breathe in their suffering and to breathe out happiness and calmness and joy and to do that visualization. And you don't have to announce yourself you don't have to tell anyone what you're doing, but you're transforming your mind anywhere you are because we're surrounded by suffering, right? So anytime we see it, we can take this moment to practice in that way. And what this does is it's continually familiarizing our mind with the Dharma. It's making the Dharma indistinguishable from our mind. When we practice in this way, everything we do becomes a spiritual practice. 
So then when we actually develop great compassion, when we develop actual bodhicitta, we can wake up with bodhicitta. We can breathe with bodhicitta. We can do housework with bodhicitta. What we're doing is making our life indistinguishable from the life of a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. And so Tongan is a really powerful way to do that because it focuses on others and on defeating your own self-cherishing at the same time. By taking the two in conjunction with your breathing and by swapping back and forth, you are totally relinquishing um, your grip on samsara. You're leaving it behind and you're prioritizing others. So you're doing both things. This is the seed of compassion in this way. You know, Bodhi, uh, Lama Zobar Mishay says, it's totally unrealistic to pray to destroy our own self-cherishing mind, but then in order to benefit others, but then to expect that we'll never have any problems or difficulties on our path. Like that's totally crazy. How can you do both those things? So what Tonglen does is it's a practice we can use when we experience problems. When we experience suffering, we can visualize, okay, this suffering I'm having right now, whether it's illness, whether it is, um, you know, I, I lost my job or someone's treating me harshly, any of these things. This suffering is me taking on the suffering of other sentient beings. And therefore this suffering is, I'm using it to defeat myself cherishing. And instead of wallowing in this suffering, I realize this suffering is an opportunity to defeat my self-cherishing mind, to have the negative karma of others ripen upon me, which I prayed for. I prayed for that and now it's happening. And so now, instead of uh, reacting, you know, with pity or with um, frustration, I send joy in response to the suffering. I spend all my happiness. I focus my mind on cherishing others completely. And so whenever we experience suffering, Tongling is a practice to help us take that suffering and transform it says the suffering we experience is the obstacles we experience in samsara are endless. We can't avoid them. But what we can do is see those obstacles as opportunities for spiritual growth, as opportunities to practice. And then those obstacles become happiness. That suffering can become joy because it is an opportunity for us to progress on the path to Buddhahood. It's an opportunity for us to forget about our own needs and prioritize others' needs, which is what Buddhas do. This doesn't make the suffering go away. You know, it doesn't solve our worldly problems. And as long as we live in the world, we have to pay attention to that, right? We need a way to, to um, keep a house, keep a roof over our heads and keep food in our bellies. If we have obligations to family, we have to make sure we can take care of them. So this isn't saying that we should just neglect our needs and we should just go live on the street and not take, you know, and regard, disregard the expectations of our own, you know, our own body uh -huh. in that way. What this is saying is that when I experience suffering, I don't need to seek it out because I know I'm going to experience it. This is samsara. When I experience it, it can become an opportunity to transform my mind and an opportunity to practice dharma and to develop actual happiness as opposed to an opportunity to further, you know, pour more cement around my feet in this samsara ocean. Those are my two options whenever I experience suffering. I can make my suffering worse and I can make it last longer, or I can let it propel me forward. Those are the two things I can do. And so by practicing Tonglen, we're taking an active decision to free ourselves from samsara and to help all other sentient beings. So in this way, Tonglen is a really beneficial and useful practice. And so as part of this, after we do this Tonglen, so Tonglen is the exchange when we're no longer cherishing ourselves, but instead we're cherishing others. We're exchanging our self-cherishing mind for the mind that cherishes others. And then, as before, from Tonlin, we meditate on the universal altruistic attitude, the special attitude of now that I've developed some conviction that um, cherishing others is more important than cherishing myself, um, and that I have given away all happiness, and I'm taking, I want to remove other suffering, I actually dedicate myself to doing that. So I understand it to be my responsibility. So that's the altruistic intention. And then we actually meditate on bodhicitta. And eventually that becomes actual bodhicitta. So those two are the same as the seven point practice. So that is the practice um, of 
equalizing and exchanging self and others combined with seven point practice. They both come from Shakyamuni Buddha um, through Asanga and Shantideva, and then formalized by Jade Tsongkhapa. But what they're both doing is showing us that the way we live in the world is one that's focused only on our own needs. And if we want to adopt compassion, it's a radical transformation we need. When we live with compassion, we're out of step with worldly reality. There isn't a lot of space for compassion, you know, in a capitalist society. The system itself isn't designed for compassion, it's designed for greed and self-promotion. Of course, there are individuals who practice compassion within it, but the system itself isn't designed for that. We don't live in a society that values compassion to such an extent that when we see anyone being kind to someone else, it strikes us as uncommon. That's how, how much we don't prioritize it in our society. And I know like living in a community of people practicing Buddhism, we can become jaded, right? Because others around us are doing the same thing. But all it takes is like one turn, turning on the news for five minutes and we realize that kindness isn't the priority of most people. You know, it's the exception, it's not the rule. So that makes it so much more important for us to develop it in our lives. And the more we can develop kindness and compassion and bodhicitta, we collapse this distinction between worldly and sacred, between spiritual and profane. And we live the life of bodhisattva in every activity we do. And what that does is it compels us, it propels us rather, closer and closer to Buddhahood. It gives us more and more tools and techniques and knowledge to help others, both in this life and in future lives, to give them worldly benefit and super mundane benefit. The only way to do that is to go against what's expected of us. The only way to do that is to fight all expectations of the status quo that says other suffering is okay as long as you're happy, as long as I get enough for me, it doesn't matter. As long as I promote my own self-interest and I get a good job and I can feed my family and I can keep a house over a roof over my head, others' needs don't matter. That's what society expects of us. That's what we're taught to believe. I can take care of myself. Everyone has this independence, right? That's what we live in samsara. So compassion says that's all backwards. And so what we're doing by practicing bodhicitta is learning how to live like Buddhas. And so these different methods place us in a lineage of practice that dates back to Shakyamuni Buddha. And it recognizes that our practice is informed by the great many masters that preceded us and those who are living with us now. So that can strengthen our practice. And so that's where we get these technologies, these meditative technologies. So Tonlen being kind of the heart practice of exchanging self and others. Okay, so with that, let's take a short break. It's five minutes, stretch our legs. We'll come back, we'll do a meditation, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. How's that sound? Okay, so just a five minute stretching our legs break. I just posted again in the chat, um, again, the suggested readings for next week. So in case you missed them before, I posted them again. <clears throat> so we'll start by, as usual, taking a comfortable seat, adopting whatever meditative posture we can given our circumstances. If we're sitting in a chair, let our feet be flat on the ground, shoulder length apart, shoulder width apart, our hands either in the meditation mudra or resting gently on our thighs, our spine straight and upright, our head following the natural curve of our spine, curving forward slightly, but not forced, our jaw nice and relaxed, not clenched, our lips and teeth hanging open, not touching, Our tongue resting in the roof of our mouth behind our upper teeth. Our eyes halfway open, following the end of our nose, not focused, but just gazing in a loose fashion. We allow our breath to fall into its natural rhythm. And for the first few moments, 
Let's take time to let our awareness focus on our breath. Notice any distracting minds that come up. And when we see them, we can label them thinking, put them down. Returning our awareness to the object of our meditation. We start by visualizing in the space in front of us our own guru. And from their heart centers, a brilliant white light of their love and compassion, their wish for us to be free from all suffering, to have every happiness. And it radiates from their light and it fills our body. And we have the actual sensation of body and mind of our teachers, love and compassion for us, filling us, overwhelming us with their infinite love and compassion. And then visualize the guru moves to the space just above and behind your head, facing the same direction as you, continually filling you with their love and compassion. A never-ending resource that motivates and replenishes your practice. And visualize in the space in front of you, three different beings. One who you might apply the label of friend. One to whom you might apply the label of enemy, someone who harms you and one to whom you might apply the label, the label of stranger. To so take a moment to actually visualize three people in front of you. And as you have a firm visualization of them in front, bring to mind, reflect on the idea that they are all the same in wanting happiness and not wanting to suffer. And my identification or label of friend, enemy, and stranger is based not in reality, but in my own deluded mind. They're all equal, equally deserving of my love and compassion. And once you've become convinced of this, you rest in some level of equanimity, visualize all sentient beings taking the form of human beings surrounding you in all sides. As far as your eye can see, all sentient beings have taken this human form and you gaze upon them and you realize they're all equal in wanting to be free from suffering and wanting happiness. They're all equal in deserving my love and compassion. And not only that, they have been kind to me in infinite ways. Kind to me as my mother, which has been my mother numberless times, and kind to me when they were not my mother. All of my happiness has come from the kindness of these sentient beings. Because all of my happiness has ever come from them, I developed a strong wish to repay their kindness. It's 
my responsibility to repay them for all the great many things they've done for me. And let this wish really permeate your mind. This isn't a perfunctory practice. This is a practice of the heart. I truly wish to repay the infinite kindness that other sentient beings have given me. And so first, we focus only on taking. So as you breathe in, visualize that all the suffering of other sentient beings you, who you see in the space in front of you takes the form of black smoke. All of their physical suffering, all of their illness, all of their mental suffering, both explicit and implicit, all of this takes the form of this thick black smoke and as you breathe in, it's drawn out of their bodies and it enters into your nostrils. And from there, it flows down toward your heart where you have the self-cherishing mind, like a steel ball. And this black smoke strikes that self-cherishing mind, breaking it into pieces. And as you breathe in and you do this visualization, you can say to yourself, may all of your suffering ripen upon me. May I take all your illness, all your unhappiness, and may that ripen on me and destroy my self-cherishing mind. So for a few moments, just focus on taking. Really try to visualize this, their suffering in the form of black smoke. Comes from all sides. And you willingly absorb it into your body as you pull it out of their sentient beings. And now we visualize giving. So as you breathe out, you visualize beautiful, brilliant white light emitting from your heart, shining in all directions. And this is you sending happiness to all sentient beings, sending all of your joy, all of your delight, all of your wealth, all of your possessions, your body, everything you have, you send in the form of white light to other beings. And they absorb it into your bodies and they experience happiness and bliss. And now alternate these two. So as you breathe in, you do the visualization of taking. You visualize drawing in the black smoke of all of their suffering. Taking it into your body, letting it ripen in your body, all their unhappiness, their physical pain, their displeasure. And as you bring that black smoke into your body, it becomes like a hammer to destroy the self-cherishing mind. And in that transformation, and as you breathe out, you send forth the brilliant white light of happiness and joy, of freedom from suffering. You give away all of your happiness, all of your possessions, all of your wealth, all of your status, even your own body. And this takes the form of brilliant white light and is absorbed into the suffering sentient beings. 
and brings them happiness. So with every in-breath and out-breath, we do these two visualizations alternating back and forth. And if it's beneficial for your visualization, you can include reciting to yourself, and I take every suffering upon my own self. And then I give away every happiness and joy. So you can recite those to yourself to accompany your visualization if that helps. If you don't need it, then don't. If at any moment you feel overwhelmed, remember that your guru is right behind you, filling you with their infinite love and compassion, recharging you, replenishing you, validating you, reminding you of your infinite capacity to love others. I mean, every unhappiness, every pain, every illness ripen upon me in this body here and now. So others do not have to experience that suffering. May every happiness or joy or contentment or delight be given to others all of my wealth, all of my possessions, even my own body, so that they might experience happiness.
And now visualize that all the sentient beings who surround you are filled with the white light of your happiness, of your joy, that you've given them everything you have, and you've taken all their suffering from them. So they experience nothing but joy and happiness, no illness, no distress, and they themselves become brilliant white, uh, white light infusing their bodies, brilliant rays of white light, and they dissolve into that white light. And that white light allows you to rejoice in their happiness. You develop a strong mind of rejoicing that others can experience happiness and joy that they do not experience suffering. And the guru behind you also dissolves into white light, their pure love and compassion. This ball of white light fills your body and remains at your heart center. It never leaves you. Our guru's wish for us to be happy and to not suffer is with us all the time. So let that fill your body, but not dissolve, not dissipate. And as you're ready, bring your awareness back to the group. Thank you for doing that practice with me. So you can see that the more in depth you do that practice on your own, and the more familiar you become with it, then wherever you are, you can do a short version of it quite easily. Just the visualization of the smoke and the white light. You can drop into that quite easily, no matter the circumstances. So if you're at work or you're, you know, anywhere where you're under the people who are causing you distress of some sort, or you see that they're suffering, you can take that as a moment just to do this visualization. And what that does, you know, it's not going to, if someone's angry at you or they're feeling distressed, doing this isn't going to solve that right away. In the, in the immediate sense. But what it will do is it'll stop your self-cherishing mind from taking control. And it will reorient you to such a way that you're dedicated to others' happiness, not your own self-cherishing mind. And so by telling your self-cherishing mind to take a back seat, and by letting the mind that cherishes others be the one driving the car, so to speak, you stop experiencing distress because you stop focusing on yourself. You stop letting everything revolve around you. And so you can bring this into any moment in your practice, any moment in your day, rather. But in order for it to be useful, and in order to be able to drop into it like that, you need to practice it more in depth on your own, when you don't have the immediate physical uh, or problems around you, right? And so that's what the point of a daily practice is. And so you can do a practice like this, and you can spend 20, 30 minutes just doing the visualization of the uh, Tonglen visualization. But you can see how all the 11 steps build up to that tonglen. They make it more powerful. If you just do the tonglen, that's helpful. But if at first you realize that all sentient beings are equal, and then you really recognize them as your mother, and then you remember how kind they've been to you, this is pushing you forward. It makes your practice much more urgent, right? When you wish to repay their kindness, your practice becomes urgent. It doesn't become just like an imagination thing. You actually feel this is something I have to do. And so by doing that, it really empowers your practice. And so take the time when you're on your own to go through all these steps. And it may be helpful to do them one, you know, one day, just focus on one of them, spend most time on that. And then the next day, spend the most time on a different one until you can be comfortable in all of them and you can do them all equally. And then no matter the circumstances, you've developed the habit, you become familiar with this practice, then you can drop into it very briefly and very quickly. But the stronger and deeper you do on your own, then the more you're able to bring this spiritual practice into your everyday life. 
and the more you're able to blur these lines between sacred and profane. So you're able to bring compassion as what guides you and not like the secondary bit player, but it's the lead character in your life is compassion and bodhicitta. So are there any other questions you want to end with today before we call it evening? Yeah, go ahead, Barbara. Thank you for your teaching, Venerable. Um, you use the term super mundane, and I've heard mm -hmm. that before, and I, I don't, if you could, exp yeah. you know, discuss that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these translation terms. So it's not super mundane, but supra mundane, S-U-P-R-A <clears throat> mundane. So it's just one of the ways we translate. In Tibetan, we have the word jigten, which is worldly. It also means the world in general. It means, it means a lot of things, but in, in this context, it means worldly or mundane. So our worldly experiences, our mundane experiences, our normal experiences, our jigten. And then supra mundane in Tibetan is jigten le depa. So what has gone beyond the mundane? So what has gone beyond the worldly? So by supra mundane, it means other than the worldly. So what has surpassed the worldly? So sometimes you could say otherworldly experiences, but that makes it sound like you're talking about aliens in space or something. So that's not always a helpful thing, you know? So that's why sometimes I say sacred or spiritual is what I'm referring to here, is a super mundane experience. Um, it's anything that is moved beyond your normal worldly experience and into something more than that. So when we say practicing the path of, practicing the paths, there's the ordinary paths and the paths that are the super mundane paths. So when you actually have direct realization into emptiness, into the nature of reality, that's a super mundane insight. So an insight that shakes the foundations of worldly thought. But so all of the activities of a Buddha are working outside of the realm of worldly existence. So that's a supra mundane. So that's all it means. It's just, you know, otherworldly is kind of the easier translation, but it just has so many other connotations that it can be an obstacle sometimes, you know. But that's what we mean. I hope that helps. Karen, did you have a question? Yeah. Well, I, a quick observation and a quick question. Um, in terms of compassion, you actually see it on the battlefield. And mm. that is one of the reasons why when uh, soldiers come home, it's very difficult uh, to explain to people that haven't experienced those remarkable acts just what they've been through in witnessing it. Um, just, just a comment. Um, so here's the question. How do you know that the joy you are feeling from a compassionate act is not ego? Mm. Um, well, so firstly, there are many examples of compassion all around us. They do exist. It's just we're not taught for them to be our status quo, right? That's not the normal. So we're, always, we're often surprised by them. So I'm not saying that others even non-Buddhist or whatever. I'm not saying there's no compassion that exists. I'm just saying that right now it's not in high supply. So when we do see it, it's something to be um, remarked upon and to, to find delight in when we see compassion. But I agree, it exists, especially in very difficult circumstances. Sometimes you see the strongest examples of it. So um, I know that you have experience on battlefields that I have not, but in other difficult situations, you see, like I've worked, you know, doing palliative care and working with people who are living and dying with different diseases or in, in the hospital. And I worked as a hospital chaplain and some of the most difficult experiences of people's lives, you see great compassion, both from family, friends, and strangers. So it does exist. It definitely exists. And that can be motivating for us and we can rejoice in that. And so I'm not trying to say it doesn't exist. I just think that in general, it isn't the norm for most people living our lives. That's not the message we're told. But why do you think it takes um, extraordinary circumstances to produce that in us in general? You know, it, 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 it's a shame as, as a species. Yeah, I'm not, I, I, I think because samsara is, you know, difficult. I'm not sure. Samsara yeah. teaches us to focus on ourselves. That's why compassion is an act that's focusing only on others. Right. And so we're taught over and over again, not just taught, excuse me, we have our, this innate you know, the Denzel Linke. So this innate understanding of ourself is truly existing. And due to that ignorance, we develop this idea that my happiness is more important than others. So the self-cherishing mind really becomes insidious and it infects all that we do. And so when you have a mind that says, I'm more important than everyone else, it's really hard for compassion to find any space, right? So I think that's the reason. And when you see others that are suffering in really extreme circumstances, since that's something most of us don't experience on a daily um, 
day, day-to-day life that shocks us a little bit. And so it like is a blow to our self-cherishing mind when we see suffering that's that exorbitant. And so because of that, it creates space for compassion that we don't have in our everyday life. I think that's one of the reasons, but the ultimate, the, the true answer is that we grasp at ourselves as truly existing. That leads to us prioritizing our own happiness over the happiness of others. And once we have that mind, it's hard for compassion. So we need something to shake um, that self-cherishing mind out of, you know, shake us out of it. And so that's what we practice the way we do. So we don't have to have compassion only when people are dying or in critical situations, but we have compassion all the time. So they don't feel even the slightest of suffering. You know, and going back to your, Oh, sorry. Well, just to go to your question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, I just said, I was going to say, you, you must know Martin Boober's book, I and now. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a nice one anyway. Okay. So um, <laughs> I think that it's easy. So the idea that the joy we have experienced some compassion isn't just like fabricated or isn't actually a form of self-cherishing. Um, I think it is easy for us to like the self-cherishing mind is very insidious, like I said. So we have to find that balance of being proud of our accomplishments and recognizing we're making spiritual or growth in the spiritual path. Like that's important. And we rejoice in all of that and trying to do that without it feeding our ego. So when you experience that joy, or you say, you know what, I actually have tamed my mind a little bit. I have been able to not experience as much anger or frustration or whatever it is. And that's something to rejoice in, right? So when you're able to recognize that, does that make you say, well, obviously that means I'm a better Buddhist or I'm a good Buddhist or I'm a good person or does that influence how you see yourself in the world? And does that um, feed your ego in any way? So you have to be careful of it, but the only way we can do is watch it. You know, we can't, there's no like, there's no being aware that it's easy for our ego to take control because it has over and over again, since beginning this rebirth and samsara, that that is our habit, right? Our habit is self-cherishing. So knowing that when we experience joy at a job well done, we experience some sort of, you know, pride at having developed our spiritual p- progress. We can look at that and try to find the purest form of it and rejoice in that. But being aware that the self-cherishing mind wants to overtake even that good, that joy, then being aware of it helps prevent it, I think. Okay, so maybe we'll end there because it is time. I don't want to keep you late. Uh, let's just take a moment to recognize that by coming together today to study the teachings of the Buddha and to learn how to develop bodhicitta and how to live our lives according to the teachings of the Buddha, we have developed some sort of merit, some sort of good karma. And instead of keeping that for ourselves, we wish to dedicate that to all sentient beings so that all sentient beings might experience the bliss of Buddhahood, that they might be free from all their suffering, both worldly and otherworldly suffering, that they might have nothing but joy and compassion in their hearts. And so any accomplishments we have, we want to give away. And so we'll do a quick dedication prayer. Through this virtue may I swiftly, having gained Guru Buddha state, place each and every sentient being. Without exception in the head state, precious supreme body mind, may it where unborn arise, and where born never decline, but increase forevermore. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I appreciate your time, your practice, your commitment. Uh, I really have a lot of joy for being able to start my days with these classes. So thank you for that. And I hope you have a great week. I hope you're able to do some of the readings or you hope to do some meditations. And I look forward to seeing you next week in our final session.